Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I now can see, perfect prison cleansing in the blood for me. Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing, Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Standing on the promises of God. Stephen was standing on the promises of God. We need to remember that standing on the promises of God is not always a way of getting out of the troubles that we find ourselves in. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 7, looking at verses 40, uh, 54 excuse me, through 56 tonight. You recall that last week we talked about resisting the Holy Ghost, and Stephen has, in verses 51 through 53, reached the climax of his sermon, told the accusers that they are in fact the ones who are guilty, that they are the ones who historically, through their ancestors and down to the present day for them, have resisted the Holy Ghost. Very important lessons to learn from that, because it tells you that even God's chosen people can resist the Spirit of God, and we find other illustrations of that in Scripture. Resisting the Holy Ghost, and they did not want to hear the message. Those who are out of fellowship, those who are not walking in the ways that God has ordained, will very often, and frank, frequently, mostly often, uh, resist when you tell them the truth. They will not like it. Uh, in fact, they may do to you as they did here to Stephen. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As we resist the Spirit of God, our hearts become hardened. It's a very dangerous situation in which to find yourself. The consistent resisting of the work of the Spirit of God in your heart will harden your heart and it will sear your conscience and you will do that which is contrary to the Word of God. 
You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. The first observation we made last week was that the Holy Ghost is a person, a divine person, a member of the Trinity, one of the three members of the Godhead. He can be resisted. He can be grieved, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.13. He can be quenched, as Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.19. He is clearly the one most perfectly involved in the exhaling, the inspiration of the scriptures coming directly from God. First Timothy, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. We saw that the Holy Spirit is involved in justification. The Holy Ghost speaks. The Holy Ghost not only speaks, but he guides believers. He is called God, where he is co-equal with the Father and the Son. I will draw your attention back to Acts chapter 5 and verses 3 and 4. Ananias and Sapphira have brought an offering because they saw that Barnabas, who had already given his offering, uh, was getting a lot of praise from the congregation. And so they decided they would do that, but they decided to have their cake and eat it too. They would give part of it and pretend that it was the entire sale price of the portion of land that they had sold. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? You can lie to the Holy Ghost. And to keep back part of the price of the land, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. The Holy Ghost is clearly stated to be God in these two verses. The Holy Ghost can be sinned against. There's the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, as we see in Matthew chapter 12. The Holy Ghost strives with men, Genesis chapter 3. The Holy Ghost instructs, regenerates, sanctifies, and comforts believers. And we saw many different passages that deal with those things. We saw also that here with these Pharisees and Sadducees, the members of the Sanhedrin, it was like father, like son, a continuation of a spiritual rebellion that went all the way back to the wilderness wanderings, which is what he had just been preaching about in the preceding verses. You always resist the Holy Ghost. Even in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was at work, though not precisely in the same way as we discussed this morning, as he now works following the fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost. <clears throat> the third thing that we saw was that they were, in fact, the ones who had violated the Abrahamic covenant of circumcision in its spiritual application. We saw that Stephen accuses them that, of that in verse 8. We saw that they had the con consistent rejection of prophecy, the prophetic word of God, and the rejection of the prophetic messengers whom God had sent. And that is, of course, the same thing that Jesus taught in the parable of the vineyard, where uh, he sent various, the master sent various servants to collect the fruit of the vineyard, and they beat some, and they drove others away and killed some, and finally he sent them his son, and they killed the son trying to claim the vineyard, and the master of the vineyard destroyed them. The fifth observation is the consistent murder of those who prophesied the specific coming of the Messiah. They persecuted many, but those who actually prophesied the coming of the Messiah were the ones that they murdered, according to Stephen's sermon here. We saw our sixth observation that as trustees of the Mosaic Law, they had been the principal violators of the Mosaic Law. And finally, they had received the law through the mediation of angels, not merely through the mediation of Moses. God had used his divine messengers, the angels, on Mount Sinai, and we saw multiple passages that teach us that truth. So tonight we are here at verses 54 through 60, the right hand of God. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine going to a court of law and having a panel of judges sitting in front of you, and as you give your testimony, the judges get so angry that they jump over the bench, they rush up to the witness stand where you are standing. They grab you and begin to bite you. That's what's going on here. They're so angry they're acting like animals. They gnashed on him with their teeth. It doesn't say they ground their teeth or grated their teeth. They gnashed on him with their teeth. That is one of the most bizarre courtroom scenes that can be imagined in the history of the world. They were so angry, they actually were running down and biting him. 
Have you ever seen little children bite one another? Well, we've seen that. We have had 13 children, and out of that there have been a few who have bitten other children, and a few of our children have been bitten by their friends. It's a nasty, nasty situation. It causes some nasty wounds, too, when it's a real bite. These men were very, very angry. They are ripping on him like wild animals with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. Can you imagine that? While you're being bitten on, basically ignoring it, being filled with the Spirit of God, looking up into heaven, and you are so entranced by what you see that it doesn't matter what's happening to you. Here's clearly a man who is full of faith. As we see earlier, where the deacons are chosen at the beginning of the chapter. Being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. They didn't want to hear it. They were so angry at what he'd already said, they're chewing on him. And then they are in such agony of spirit and conviction of sin that they don't want to hear what else he's saying about Jesus standing on the right hand of God. They begin to scream and close their ears. It's absolute bedlam in the court. It's a very formal court. Imagine yourself in a court today. Some of you may have been in a traffic court at one point. Some of you may have been in a, uh, some kind of a civil court, in a lawsuit. I hope none of you have been in criminal court. Um, perhaps you have been in a state court. Perhaps you have seen some trials in federal court. Or maybe you've seen some appeals in federal court right across the river here in Philadelphia. It's very, very, very formal. It would be the most utter and bizarre situation to see a judge act like this. I mean, that's the kind of case that ultimately on appeal would be thrown out of court. I mean, the judges would probably be removed from the bench, though appointed for life in federal court. But that is the kind of thing that would instantly stop a trial and demonstrate that you've got a mistrial. But that's not what happens here with Stephen. Even though this is supposed to be a court that represents the standards of God, not merely the standards of men. Here you find the judges acting as vicious animals out of control. They cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. It's a powerful passage. We've studied each portion of his sermon, the way in which he built his case. It's an airtight case whereby he demonstrates that he is not the guilty party, but that those who are sitting to judge him are in fact the guilty party. We think, what a travesty of law, what, what a horrible and sad end to the case, but you see the case isn't over yet. Because there was one sitting in the heavens higher than that court. There was a court of appeals. There is a court before whom each one of those who sat to judge Stephen that day would someday have to stand and give an account for what they had done. Dear friends, whatever God allows to happen in your life. And God was clearly aware of what was happening to Stephen. God was clearly watching what was happening to Stephen. The Lord Jesus Christ is not merely seated at the right hand of the Father. He was standing. We will see a very interesting distinction as we look at different portions of Scripture tonight talking about Christ seated at the right hand of the Father versus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father. Twice in the text it tells us here, Jesus standing on the right hand of God, verse 55. And verse 56, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. We learn many things as we look at this text tonight. 
The first thing that I think is quite obvious is you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and still be killed by the enemies of God. You and I often assume, but not always rightly so, that when we're filled with the Spirit of God, everything will go our way. We are commanded to be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. We are commanded to be walking in the Spirit. We are commanded to be walking by faith. We are commanded to witness boldly and faithfully. Stephen is doing all of these things here, and he is killed by a vicious mob. If you stop and consider it and look over the history of the church, in every land of this world you discover that there are those who, because of their faith, because of their witness, yes, even because of the fact that they were filled with the Spirit of God and their enemies were not, and the enemies could see the difference, killed them. That should be no surprise to us. It goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. And it's explained to us in 1 John the reason why. Wherefore slew he him? Because his brother's works were righteous and his own works were evil. Speaking of Cain and Abel, why did Cain kill Abel? Because he saw that his brother's works were righteous and he saw that his own works were unrighteous. And rather than repenting, although God had provided a lamb, a sin offering, for Cain, if he would but take it, it was crouching at his door. God tells him so. God had brought it. Rather than doing that and humbling himself to get rid of the contrast, he merely killed his brother. It's one of the things that we discover very sadly throughout history because, as I said this morning, we are in a spiritual war. And in war there are casualties. Sometimes the very bravest of the troops, those who have pressed forward to the front lines, those who are making the greatest assault upon the enemy, are the ones that the enemy cannot tolerate to live. And so we see it here because Stephen was the man, you recall, who with his sound doctrine and with the ability to proclaim as he did, was putting down all of those who opposed the gospel earlier in this chapter. The enemy couldn't tolerate it. Second thing we learn is not only you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and still be killed by the enemies of God, you can preach the truth and still be killed by the enemies of God. You look through Stephen's sermon. There is nothing in that sermon that is a lie. There is nothing that is aberrant. There is nothing that is twisting the history of the nation of Israel. These are men who knew the history, and Stephen recounts it to them, building stone upon stone upon stone to show what has happened in the past and how it is happening in the present. You can walk by faith and still be killed by the enemies of God. Stephen isn't here and being killed because suddenly his faith slipped, the enemy saw an opening and they got through to him and killed him. He was walking by faith. You can use irresistible logic and watertight proofs. Stephen does that and still be killed by the enemies of God. But you know there is a bright ray of light and our attention is drawn to it in verse 8. You never know who you will reach for Christ even as you go to your death. There was a young man standing by and the witnesses cast their clothes at his feet. They knew him well. They knew he would take care of their clothes. He was an honest young man. He was a rabbinic student. He was a young man who was very, very strict about the things of the law, and he certainly would not steal their clothes or anything out of their pockets. A young man named Saul. We're going to see more about Saul in chapter 8 as he persecutes the church, and then more about Saul in chapter 9 as he is struck down by the heavenly light of the Shekinah glory on the road to Damascus. He has heard the sermon. He has seen Stephen as Stephen looks to heaven and declares that he sees Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Stephen declaring that Jesus is in the Shekinah. And it is Jesus who speaks to Stephen out of the Shekinah, excuse me, speaks to Saul out of the Shekinah glory in chapter 9. 
You never know whom you will reach for Christ if you have a faithful testimony even in the hour of death. The right hand of God. What takes place at the right hand of God? The first thing we discover is back in the book of Genesis. The right hand is the place of blessing. In Genesis 48, 14, Israel, that's the new name for Jacob, you recall, stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And Joseph, the father of these two boys, is upset about that, and he says, not so, my father, because Manasseh is the firstborn. Put your right hand on him. It's the place of primal blessing. As the hand is laid, the right hand on the forehead. And then Israel says, I know, my son, I know, but God has a special blessing for Ephraim. A blessing that Manasseh is not going to get. Oh, he'll be blessed also, but the primary blessing will go to the younger of the two. That's why I placed my right hand on his head. We find that's true in the New Testament. Our Lord Jesus Christ is speaking of it in the great prophetic statements of Matthew chapter 25 concerning the future. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. In verse 34, a little few down the way as a bit, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The right hand, the place of blessing. Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father. The right hand is also the place of the destruction of the enemies of God. We see an illustration of that in Exodus 15, verse 6. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Again, in Psalm 121, in verse 8, Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out all those that hate thee. It's the place of destruction for the enemies of God. It is also the place of chastening for those who rebel against God. You recall Nathan and Abiram, Nadab and Abihu, Exodus 15, 12, Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. It's the source of the law of God. Deuteronomy 33, 2. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran. He came with ten thousands of his saints. From his right hand went the fiery law for them. He's talking about what happens on Mount Sinai. He's talking about the right hand of God extended to give the tables of the law to Israel. We see that the right hand is a place of royal honor. First Kings chapter 21, or excuse me, chapter 2, verse 19. Bathsheba therefore went into King Solomon to speak unto him for Adonijah. And the king rose up to meet her and bowed himself unto her and sat down on his throne and caused a seat to be set for the king's mother and she sat on his right hand. Now you know that she's about to ask the question, that Abishag, the Shunammite, be allowed to be Adonijah's wife. Abishag, the young woman who had been given to David as a wife, but he had never known her. And then David dies, and so here is this young virgin that Adonijah would very much like to marry. But Solomon recognizes that if, if Adonijah marries her, the wife of the former king, that then he has a claim to the throne. And you know the rest of the story how Solomon has Adonijah put to death. But... Bathsheba is seated at his right hand before he knows all of this. Psalm 45, 9, King's daughters were among thine honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in the gold of Ophir. Or Psalm 110, verse 1, a very important messianic psalm. In fact, one of the most important messianic psalms. Psalm 110, verse 1, a psalm of David. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool is a prophecy about what our Lord Jesus Christ did following the resurrection where he went and was seated on the right hand of the Father. We'll see some verses about that in a few moments. It's the place of honor. Matthew 22, 44, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. 
Jesus quotes that verse about himself when they challenge him as to his messianic claims. He's just answered the three different challenges as to why he can't be the Messiah. Oh, there were the Herodians. They came to him with the coin and said, should we pay taxes? There were the Sadducees who came to him and challenged him. They didn't believe in the resurrection. So they gave him the story about a woman who was married to seven different brothers under Leveret Law and didn't have any children by them. And they asked him, okay, so whose wife is she in the resurrection? Lord Jesus Christ answers the questions and then he challenges them. And he quotes Psalm 110. We've been over it, so we won't go over it again. But a fascinating understanding of that place of royal honor. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That great high priest, of course, is our Lord Jesus Christ. The right hand is the source of deliverance. Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Show thy loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand, them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. Psalm 60, verse 5, that thy beloved may be delivered, save with thy right hand, and hear me. Psalm 108, verse 6, that thy beloved may be delivered, save with thy right hand, and answer me. Psalm 138, verse 7, though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me, thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against my enemies and thy right hand shall save me. Isaiah 41.10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. The scriptures are replete with passages of scripture that tell us about the right hand of God and what the right hand of God does. God may be speaking anthropomorphically but he nonetheless expresses to us through that picture what he will do for his people. He expresses through that picture the position of honor, the position of strength, the position of deliverance, and also the place of joy. Psalm 1611, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Wonderful verse, often quoted at funerals. As we look forward with joy and anticipation and eagerness to what Jesus promised in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, that he's going to prepare a place for us. Is it going to be a dull place? Is it going to be all in shades of gray? Is it going to be food that tastes like cardboard? Is it going to be dully stringing a three-string harp, twang, 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 twang? I mean, is that what heaven is going to be like? At thy right hand, which is a place of honor, there are pleasures forevermore. Magnificent pictures that are given to us. It is a place of sustenance. Psalm 18.35 Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath holden me up. He sustains us. He holds us up. Thy gentleness hath made me great. Psalm 63, 8. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. The place of sustenance, of being sustained. The right hand is the place of salvation. Psalm 20, verse 6. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. It's a place of victory. Psalm 44, 3, For they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither didst their own arm save them, but thy right hand and thine arm, and the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst a favor unto them. Psalm 98, 1, O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things, his right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. It's a place of victory, truly. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous, the right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. Do you get the idea? To get to the right hand, you also have to be in harmony with his righteousness. Psalm 48, 
10. According to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. You can't get there in your own righteousness. You can't get there in your own strength. He had already told us that. You must have the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who have placed their faith in Christ are in him. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians 1 we are told that we are in him, in Christ, in the beloved. You and I, because of our position in Christ, are able to, to be in that place of honor, in that place of righteousness in that place of deliverance, in that place of salvation, in that place of victory, in that place of strength. Stephen looks up and he sees the Lord Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God. And these wicked, evil, hard-hearted men who sit to judge him cannot stand even the sound that he is making and declaring concerning Christ. You see, they are the ones who have crucified Christ. They are the ones who know the Old Testament scriptures, which I have been reading. They know what the right hand of God is like. It's not once or twice in the Old Testament. I mean, I haven't even begun, really, to read all the different passages. There are 168 places in the Bible where it talks about the right hand of God. I'm only giving you a small handful to show the different ways in which that picture is used in the Scriptures for us. It's the place of righteousness. It is the place of protection. Psalm 73, 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by thy right hand. Thou hast a mighty arm, and strong is thy hand. High is thy right hand. Isaiah 41, 13. For the Lord thy God will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. It's a place of protection. It's a place of comfort. Oh, this is not merely in the Old Testament. This is also... In the New Testament, Revelation 1.17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. The sight is so terrifying that John falls as dead before his feet. The resurrected Christ, the one whom he knew so well that at the Last Supper he was able to place his head in the bosom of Jesus and ask him, Who is it that is going to betray you? But when he sees him in his glory, in Revelation chapter 1, he falls at his feet as dead. But Christ has not changed. He merely reveals his glory at that moment to John. But he is still the one who loves the beloved disciple. He is the one who places his right hand upon John, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. The right hand of God is the source of God's creative power. Isaiah 43, 13. My hand also hath laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand has spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. That takes us back to Genesis chapter 1, where God cast out the firmament, spread the expanse of heaven, and placed all the stars and planets into it. It's portrayed for us as being done by the right hand of God, the source of his creative power. The hand, the right hand, symbolizes the signs of promise. Daniel 12:7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand into heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, that there shall be for a time, times, and in half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Magnificent Prophecies, Daniel chapter 12, makes it very clear that he's talking about Daniel's people, that is the Jewish people, who will have to go through these times of troubles, 
that are described by that three and a half year period set forth here. But you know, it's uh, more poignant as we look into the Gospels and discover Jesus making another reference to the right hand of God. The right hand of the Father. You see, Jesus had stood before the same council that Stephen is standing before. Jesus had remained silent as the false witnesses accused him until finally they found two that said, well, he said, I'm going to destroy the temple and build it again in three days. And Stephen has just covered that in his sermon. He has just drawn the attention of all these hard-hearted priests back to the point where they condemned Christ. He's just talked about first the tabernacle, but then he talked about the temple. They would have immediately, knowing Stephen is preaching the same things about Jesus that they had not wanted to hear before, and that suddenly they have the uncomfortable feeling he's actually fulfilled. He's drawing them back. And then he's reminding them in these verses here of what Jesus said when they finally cried out against him the charge of blasphemy. Listen to Matthew chapter 26, verses 63 through 66. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Now finally, Jesus responds. He hasn't responded until then. Okay, I'm putting you on a question right now. I want to know the answer to one question. Are you the Christ, the Son of God? I'm putting you under oath by the living God. Are you the Christ, the Son of God? Listen to what Jesus responds. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. In our vernacular we might say something like, You got it. Right on target. Precisely so. Thou hast said. But he doesn't stop there. Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He takes them back to Daniel chapter 7, to the vision of the Ancient of Days coming in the Shekinah glory to judge. He says, you've got it, that's me, and let me tell you something else. Someday you're going to see me coming on the clouds of heaven. You're going to see me at the right hand of God the Father. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Stephen, you see, has done precisely the same thing. He brings them precisely to the same point when he stands up and says, I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. That was the point where they broke before. That's where the point where they break again. Instead of repenting, instead of saying, you know, we were wrong back then. We sinned. We confess it is sin. We repent and tear their clothes in repentance. They tear their clothes again in anger and rush on him and chew on him. Before they at least went through getting the Romans' permission to crucify Christ, but here they are so angry that without getting any permission from anybody at all, they are so angry, they grab him, they chew on him, they drag him outside, and they stone him to death instantly. It takes us back to what really is the key issue. Is Jesus who he said he is? And did Jesus do what he said he would do? That takes us back to the heart of the gospel. Who Jesus is, he's not merely a man, he is God. They couldn't take that. What did he do? He died for our sins, 
and he rose from the dead. And this group of men knows that this is the gospel that the apostles have been preaching through the first six chapters of the book of Acts. And it means that they are guilty. They've had time to contemplate it. They've dragged the apostles in in chapter 4. They've dragged the apostles in in chapter 5. We get over to chapter 7 now. They can't take it anymore. They've got to stop this message. They have an option. They have a choice. They can choose either to repent of their sins. They see all the evidence before them. They see the miraculous power of the gospel as it had been working. You know, when Peter and John and the others were preaching in the temple, on the day of Pentecost, they saw the supernatural power of God in the midst of 3,000 Jewish men on that day and the tongues of fire resting on the heads of the apostles. When Peter healed the man that was lame, they saw the power of God working through the apostles. They had heard the message. These guys were not preaching off in Timbuktu someplace, and then a, a horseman would bring a, a hastily scribbled message about what was going on. They were preaching in the temple. Stephen was so powerful in his preaching that it couldn't be refuted. The only way to stop his mouth was to kill him. I suspect that most of us are so wishy-washy, so backward in our presentation, so obscure that people most of the time don't even understand what we're pushing at. That was not Stephen. Stephen was a brilliant man. Stephen was a highly skilled man. Stephen was a courageous man. But if you couldn't shut him up any other way, you had to kill him. He brought them back precisely to where they had been with Jesus. They could have said, you know, we were wrong with Jesus. He rose from the dead. This is exactly what he said. And now Stephen is claiming he sees Jesus on the right hand of God. Jesus had talked about it. He said, someday you're going to see that. Stephen says, I see it. We will not hear it. He has spoken blasphemy. What further need we have of witnesses? They answered and said, he's guilty of death. But you know, that's the place where Jesus is now. Mark chapter 16, verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. The position of honor, the position of power, the position of deliverance, the position of salvation position of encouragement, the position where you and I are seated in Christ, in the heavenlies. Do you understand what an honor that is to be in Christ? That is positional truth from Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. It is also the place from which Christ and the Father sent the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.33 Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. That's the day of Pentecost. Peter explaining theologically what has happened practically to the twelve apostles as they stood and preached in eighteen different languages in the courtyard of the men in the temple. He's at the right hand of the Father and he has sent forth this which you now see and hear. It is the place from which Christ intercedes for us. Romans 8.34 Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. What a privilege. The one who is seated in the most honored position is the one who petitions on our behalf. That's fantastic. The picture that is being described for us here in Romans chapter 8 is the position of the one who is most beloved by the Father, the one to whom the Father never gives a no answer is making a petition on your behalf 
and on my behalf. And nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, as Paul goes on to explain. The right hand is the place where we are seen as being in Christ. Ephesians 1.20, I've mentioned it, but let me read it. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The position of Christ that sets the standard for our practice in Christ is the right hand. Colossians 3.1 If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. If that's your position, make it the practice of your life, he said. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead with Christ, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Where is he? At the right hand. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Dear people, these are not mere words. This is the truth that God has promised to us. For Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. The right hand is also the place that signifies the finished work of Christ. Hebrews 1.3 Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. This is the place that signifies the finished work of Christ when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 10.12 But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Do you think the scripture is making a point here? You understand why God is giving us so much information about Christ being seated on the right hand of the Father? This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, it's the place that signifies the finished work of Christ, sat down on the right hand of God. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Over and over and over and over. It takes us back, the book of Hebrews, takes us back to the Old Testament, to all those passages that we read a moment ago that you perhaps yawned your way through and thought, well, why is he telling us this? It's because Christ fulfills all that we see in the Old Testament. The scriptures point to Jesus. The finished sacrifice for sin. It shows that he has done it, and he has done it forever. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. It is a place that signifies the superiority of Christ. Hebrews 1.13, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That takes us back to Psalm 2, another of the great messianic psalms. A quotation from it. The angels don't have that honor. The angels don't have that privilege. Though they be mighty indeed, they do not have that position. Under which of the angels said he at any time, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That's what he said to the Son, not to the angels. It's the place that shows the divine authority of Christ. 1 Peter 3.22 Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. It not only shows his superiority, but it shows his divine authority. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Why? Because he is on the right hand of God. Back to our text. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looks up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. That's the Shekinah glory. These Jews know what's going on, and they will not repent. 
and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, he says two things. He speaks to the one whom he sees, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And as he's dying, he kneels down, cries with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Safe in the arms of Jesus. Safe on his gentle breast. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Could you say that? Could I say that? He's just preached a powerful message. It almost seems like he's angry in his message. And like he would yell, Lord, smash them good for this. That was the attitude, you remember, of James and John. When the cities of the Samaritans wouldn't receive them on one occasion. And they said, Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven on them? Jesus said unto them, you know not of what spirit you are. Stephen is a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Stephen is a man who at this very moment is walking by faith. He is a man who has no bitterness in his spirit, no anger in his spirit, no desire for revenge in his spirit. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, his last words. And he falls asleep. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that we might learn both from the sermon of Stephen and from the life of Stephen. A man who had not only correct doctrine, but he had a correct life. A life that was filled with the Spirit of God. A life that was courageous in the face of danger. A life that was unashamed of the gospel and testimony of Jesus Christ. A life that was pure and irreproachable. A life that bore testimony that those who had hardened their hearts could not bear to hear. He didn't back down. He didn't give up. He didn't decide he'd said enough when he was halfway through his sermon. He finished it with the earnest desire, as clearly seen by his closing words, for the salvation of those who were killing him. As with the words of Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Gracious Father, we pray that you will give us the Spirit of Christ, the ability to respond with gentleness and kindness, even when others are being obnoxious and perhaps even severely persecuting us, that we would demonstrate and show forth the fact that your Holy Spirit controls us, not merely that he indwells us. And that the words of our lips would also reflect what is in our life as we treat others with gentleness and kindness and with forgiveness. We thank you, Father, for this, your word. We pray that you will take it, apply it to our hearts, and glorify your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is at your right hand, and from whence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. From whence he will come to call us back to be with him forever in heaven. From which he will come to judge the earth. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.